Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. American citizens have been going to the polls today and indeed for several weeks now to make their choices in presidential, congressional, and various state and local contests. As we are all waiting for the results and their implications, one fact is already clear. Neither the fears nor the hopes that in the run-ups to the election significant events will take place have materialized. Iran did not immediately try to suddenly go nuclear, and no ceasefire and hostage release deal was reached in the Hamas-Israel war. The next phase is the transition period starting tonight and ending January 20th. So as we are watching the unfolding drama, let's try to analyze the final weeks and months of the Biden administration with our distinguished guests, all the way from the United States, Professor Russell Berman, formerly a senior advisor at the State Department's foreign planning staff, currently is the director of the Middle East and Islamic World Working Group at Hoover Institutions at Stanford University. It's great to have you with us, Professor Berman. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. The pleasure is all ours. Also joining us uh, from elsewhere here in Israel is Ambassador Dania Yalon, who formerly served as Israel's ambassador to the United States, a deputy foreign minister, as well as the chief uh, foreign policy advisor at the prime minister's office. It's a pleasure having you with us here, Ambassador Ayalon. Thank you, Jonathan. Always good to be on TV7. Absolutely. Well, uh, let's immediately dive into the day at hand. Professor Berman, I'm sure that you've already voted. Uh, what can you tell us uh, about the latest, particularly now that it is the last stretch, several hours before we are expected to find out who is going to lead not only the United States, from the White House, of course, in Washington, D.C., but is going also to dictate, to a large extent, uh, the foreign policy for the Middle East at large and Israel in particular. Well, Jonathan, the good news is that pretty soon we'll have pretty firm numbers about the outcomes. We've been speculating for the past month, and right now it still is just speculation. speculating. Um, it's been um, irritatingly frustrating, uh, really, um, to work through the various polls that have come in over the past month. Uh, it seems like uh, they're, they're very close, uh, uh, and um, it seems like President Trump was gaining some momentum at the very end. Uh, we do have one um, one uh, fact. Uh, there is a small town in New Hampshire, Dixville, New Hampshire, where is the custom to vote um, just after midnight uh, on election day. Uh, so they voted, and in the six inhabitants there have split three to three. Uh, that points to a divided country. On the other hand, in 2020, President Trump only got got no votes there, so he's improved in Dixville, New Hampshire. Um, more seriously, um, we'll be looking at the so-called battleground states. There's some indication that the Harris campaign is very worried about um, Pennsylvania. She did a lot of campaigning there at the very end. Those are important electoral votes. And of course, this is an interesting state, especially for viewers in Israel, because she decided against um, taking on Josh Shapiro, the Jewish governor, the very popular Jewish governor there, as her vice president candidate. If she had taken him on, she'd probably have an easier time winning Pennsylvania, which may be one of the keys to the election. Beyond that, we're reading tea leaves. Indeed. Well, Ambassador Ayalon, I'd love to hear your take on this. Naturally, we do have 147,000 Israelis uh, who are dual Israeli-American citizens eligible to vote. Uh, your wife is American. My wife is American. Of course, we have half a stake in this whole matter. But the implications, of course, for the state of Israel are vast. And according to the last polls, uh, we're talking about 66% of Israelis uh, favoring President Donald J. Trump over Kamala Harris, who secured a support rate of only 17%. Yes, it's more than uh, three to one in favor of Trump here in Israel, which is quite uh, unique. I think Israel is the only country where uh, not only there is such a huge uh, uh, gap, but also the one which favors uh, Trump. 
And uh, I think uh, it should be uh, no surprise uh, because uh, we have experienced the, um, you know, the Trump's uh, presidency from 2016 to 2020, uh, January 2020, uh, uh, 2021. And as far as his policies towards the Middle East and Israel in specific, I think they were quite judicious, quite bold, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, were, have been bearing uh, success and fruits until now. As far as Israel uh, is concerned, of course, he was the, the president who moved the embassy, American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. By the way, uh, before him, I remember uh, all the presidential candidates before him from, um, I would say, uh, um, maybe 1980 on, all promised that they would move uh, the, the uh, embassy if they won the elections. He's the only one who actually delivered. Uh, he also recognized Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Uh, he also, um, I don't want to mention the, I mean, he saw eye to eye with Israel vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran and the JCPOA, the, uh, the nuclear deal, which we both uh, saw as a dangerous one and not uh, sufficient in terms of uh, verification and uh, competency. And also one thing we should not overlook uh, that uh, during his term, the United States was a real staunch defender of Israel in international bodies, organizations, and really they were fighting anti-Israel or anti-Zionist, which is the new, uh, I would say, uh, uh, name for anti-Semitism. Uh, it, it was quite a, um, an amazing to see the U.S. behind Israel. And... Um, he also is the one that uh, took out Soleimani, uh, the head of the uh, Al-Quds um, forces of the Iranian um, um, Revolutionary Guard, a real major uh, nemesis, I would say, of Israel and, and the West. So I think this is something which could be natural, especially as Kamala Harris is not a known quantity here. Indeed, she was a vice president for the last four years, but not really very versed or very um, involved in, uh, in foreign affairs. Uh, actually, only since she was uh, appointed a, as a maybe, you can say, default uh, candidate after Biden had to bow out, only then she began talking about uh, issues here in the Middle East, the war in Gaza and in Lebanon. And... Um, and what she said was not actually something that was pleasant to Israeli ears. Also, we have to uh, remember that uh, Trump brought about the Abram Accords, and uh, he is very much respected, not in the United States. And I know I'm not going to uh, uh, be a uh, you know somebody who uh, speaks in his favor, but he brought about uh, the Abram Accord and the Saudis, the uh, Gulf uh, course countries also uh, prefer him because they see him as an effective here. So at the end of uh, my uh, two uh, long remarks, I would like to say, Jonathan, that uh, Israel and the United States at the end of the day are natural allies. So it almost makes no uh, difference who occupies the White House. The uh, relationship, the bond will continue very strongly. With regard to your remark about the popular, uh, popularity ratings of President Trump, of course, uh, we will have to see tonight uh, what are those popularity ratings, and ultimately uh, that will reflect uh, the will of the American people. Uh, but uh, it is quite interesting that here in Israel there was more favor towards uh, President Biden, who is regarded as a Zionist vocally, uh, with, uh, of course, stipulations about matter of policy, which there is a difference there, but the matter of uh, Zionism, the fact or the, the core of this uh, uh, word or determination is uh, the, the right of the Jewish people to uh, self-determination, uh, their right to uh, a nation state for the Jewish people in their ancestral homeland, namely the land of the Bible here in Israel. Uh, but with that being said, uh, it seems like the rhetoric that or the narrative uh, that uh, VP Harris uh, chose to pursue in light of the public display on campuses and elsewhere, particularly also in Michigan, uh, deep concerns have 
trickled down into Israeli society uh, and impacted uh, very much so the the uh, voting patterns, at least uh, thus far. We will have to wait and see uh, ultimately what uh, the final tally uh, indicates. But Professor Berman, if we're talking about uh, the foreign policy, Ambassador Ayalon laid out quite extensively uh, the two schools of thought uh, that uh, at least are regarded as such in the Middle East. Uh, President Trump is regarded, irrespective of any selection committees in Norway uh, providing peace accord uh, or the Nobel Peace Prize to uh, individuals uh, as such as President Obama and uh, the uh, late uh, leader of the PLO, namely Yasser Arafat, uh, President Trump is regarded as a peacemaker. He brought about the Abraham Accords. He normalized relations between uh, the Qataris and the Gulf Cooperation Council. He did much in the region that brought about a certain sense of peace and security that was not very prevalent prior to that, uh, as opposed to Vice President Harris that doesn't have that track record in her favor, and therefore there is much speculation on whether or not she would pursue the same foreign policy as the current uh, team in the White House that has brought about, unfortunately, be it on their own accord or uh, not, that doesn't really matter because it happened on their watch, uh, a raging war in the Middle East with prospects for an even wider escalation at this point in time. Jonathan, um, President Trump uh, presents himself, and I find this credible, as the peace candidate. Uh, he emphasizes again and again that uh, wars did not uh, did not start when he was in the White House. Um, this is not because he's a pacifist, it's not because he's a dove, but because he believes that strength and stability are important to maintain international order. Um, uh, the Abraham Accords were a brilliant initiative, and I believe the logic of the Abraham Accords still still prevail. That will that that is the foundation, I think, for uh, President um, President Trump's next uh, Middle East foreign policy should he return to the White House. Uh, Vice President Harris uh, does not have a foreign policy track record. Um, she only began to articulate uh, positions once she became a candidate, really, uh, pretty, pretty late in the game. What is uh, concerning, I believe, is that um, uh, Vice President Harris, or rather her campaign, um, has um, different stories in different parts of the United States. Uh, her campaign ads on television in Pennsylvania with a relatively large uh, Jewish vote uh, emphasize support for Israel. Her campaign ads in Michigan where the Arab vote is uh, crucial for winning those um, votes in the Electoral College emphasize the suffering in Gaza. So she's playing both sides of the um, of the street here, depending on which state she's campaigning in. There's an interesting twist in the Michigan story, though. Um, as you understand, and I'm sure many of your viewers understand, at stake are the Electoral College votes for Michigan, where you have the largest uh, Arab community in the United States. And the, uh, the Harris campaign assumed early on that um, the, uh, the Arab community would vote all on the basis of Gaza and the war there. In fact, the Arab American community is pretty diverse in the United States. Uh, some are Palestinian, some are Yemenites, uh, some are Egyptian, and many are Syrians. And those Syrians, it seems, according to recent developments, may be voting more because they fled the Assad regime and therefore are disinclined to support an administration, the Biden-Harris administration, that tilts toward Iran. Uh, it, it, the, we don't, we'll see the results eventually, but it could be that uh, the Harris campaign succeeds both in doing poorly with the Jewish vote and with the Arab vote. Very interesting indeed. Ambassador Ayalon, your, your take on that? Well, it, I, I find it quite uh, maybe logical for the, by, the, by the Harris uh, campaign to, uh, you know, give different messages in different areas. I think all uh, uh, politicians uh, do that and they... Uh, I would say, perfect this uh, um, phenomenon of uh, speak to their uh, uh, crowd, whoever they, it is, uh, in, in their own uh, uh, terms. But 
It is true that uh, in Michigan, there is probably the largest uh, Arab community in the United States, in any state of the 50 states of the Union. I, I believe it's uh, to the, you know, 300,000. But I wonder how would that um, campaign, let's say catering to the uh, Muslim, how would that be perceived and taken by the Jewish community in Michigan, which is double uh, in numbers than the, the Arab? And uh, even though uh, many of them uh, certainly are not natural uh, Trump supporters, but uh, by um, just them keeping at home and not going to vote, that also could be a, um, you know, a detraction from, uh, from the campaign or her, the results. It seems to me, uh, as a rule of thumb, that uh, Harris cannot win without Michigan, as I believe Trump cannot win without Pennsylvania. Right. Well, the way I see it, uh, all will come down to Pennsylvania. And the fact of the matter is having 130,000 Amish joining, uh, registering to vote for the first time in U.S. history in those quantities of numbers speaks volumes uh, because of uh, certain frustrations on domestic issues. But going back to the foreign policy element, uh, to what degree are there uh, U.S. dual U.S. Israeli nationals or U.S. Palestinian nationals living here in the region or even other uh, denominations and nationalities uh, who are eligible to vote and will, uh, to a certain degree, push for a one administration over another, obviously one foreign policy school of thought over the other? Uh, I'm not familiar really with the makeup of the... Um um, dual citizen American electorates in the in the Middle East, uh, in Israel, Israel or elsewhere, and of course the key issue will be in which state their votes count. Uh, if their votes count in um, in uh, in New York or California, I am going to guess that New York and California are going to have Democratic majorities no matter what. Um, uh, therefore, the, 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 their, their votes really don't make that much of a difference. They do make a difference, of course, in the total popular vote outcome, uh, which is going to be part of the discussion after the, um, uh, after the election, uh, even though it's really, in the end, the Electoral College that catapults someone into the into the into the White House, um, you know, you mentioned the Amish vote. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, uh, um, this will count, as, of course, especially in Pennsylvania, which is where they're they're largely located. Um, there are there are interesting religion sub uh, subcurrents in the in the um, in the election. Not just the Amish, but the Orthodox Jewish community in New York is uh, coming out strongly for for President Trump. Um, a, but in the larger um, uh, Christian community, the fact of uh, Vance's uh, conversion to Catholic, Catholicism has attracted some attention, uh, especially because uh, Vice President Harris chose to skip the Al Smith dinner in New York, a major event for the Catholic community. So uh, there are there are there are other other cross currents here that are neither Jewish nor Muslim that may impact the religion profile of the outcomes. Indeed. Well, uh, let's shift gears. There are two more uh, matters of polling. Uh, the first, of course, being the House of Representatives, the other being the Senate. Uh, Ambassador Ayalon, uh, currently, of course, the Democrats hold the Senate with a slight majority for the Republicans in the House of Representatives, namely Congress. Uh, are we expected to see the same? Well, that's quite interesting. I believe there are more open seats on um, the um, Republican uh, side, which gives the uh, Democrats uh, some advantage. Uh, the opposite is in the Senate. So it could easily be that uh, we find a, uh, a flip in terms of uh, this time the, uh, the House will go, Repub will go Democrat and the Senate uh, will go uh, uh, Republican, as opposed to the uh, situation right now. But this is certainly very, very important, because um, I, I believe that uh, by uh, uh, definition, almost, the Americans like to see a separation of power. And uh, the, the periods where both the um, Congress 
and the administration are of the same party are quite rare. Professor Berman, do you see it in the same light? And uh, just uh, in layman's terms, if you could make some sense for those who are less uh, politically inclined, uh, the Senate is more focused on foreign policy issues, while Congress is more domestic oriented. Nevertheless, both have very important uh, uh, weight for any American foreign policy, particularly also at times of war. I think the the, the key point is to emphasize that um, in a parliamentary system, your 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 president, your uh, your prime minister, automatically has majority in the legislature. That's not the case in the United States, where there's divided power, um, a balance of power between uh, the executive and the legislative and the judicial branch. Uh, the um, uh, key key acts depend on congressional approval, uh, ratification of treaties, ratification of ambassadorships, uh, the budget. Uh, there's a limit to what the president can do um, on, uh, on his or her own. Um, of course, we have seen a uh, disturbing development in American democracy in the, over the past administrations where more and more has been done by executive order. Uh, some of this has been challenged in, um, in the Supreme Court and some of it has been been blocked. Um, there are there are Americans who say that it's good if there's a division of power. If one party has the White House and the other party has at least one of the houses, because that slows things down. And the genius of the American Constitution is to make big change difficult. Um, but um, but we will see. Uh, uh, we'll we'll know hopefully soon. Some of the vote counting may take a long time, in fact, but hopefully we will know soon um, what the outcome will be. Ambassador Ayalon, as I mentioned earlier, 66% of Israelis do support uh, President Trump, over 17% who support Harris. Nevertheless, those who voted for the governing coalition in Jerusalem today, 93% of them support President Trump, over just 1% who support uh, Vice President Harris. Uh, what should we interpret out of this? Is this uh, expected to be a decisive uh, uh, aspiration of the government in Jerusalem to, uh, to be more inclined towards a Trump administration over a Harris administration, as opposed to the Islamic Republic of Iran, for instance, which the FBI investigation into a number of cyber offenses and uh, malicious uh, election interference have indicated were more supported, uh, supportive of a Harris administration at the expense of a Trump administration. Yes, I think certainly this is uh, the, the mood uh, in the uh, coalition now, or the supporters of uh, Netanyahu's uh, coalition, especially in the far right uh, parties who have suffered sanctions. Uh, from the Biden administration on individuals and on companies which are in the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. So um, maybe it is a natural thing for them to go with, uh, with uh, Trump. They also remember quite vividly that a, um, a Democrat administration, Democratic administration, was not very, I would say, supportive of Netanyahu. Netanyahu endured eight years of uh, President Obama and then now four years of uh, uh, Biden. The four years of Trump uh, was kind of a honeymoon between the two individuals and the two administrations. So I think that, again, there's no surprise why the uh, coalition voters in Israel would favor Trump. Uh, just remembering vividly the 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 last Democratic administration, which secured dominating uh, or dominant support in Israel, uh, was the Bill Clinton administration, uh, which was uh, hailed as, as one of the most pro-Israeli administrations in uh, recent history, of course, uh, until uh, the Trump administration secured roughly about the same support uh, numbers uh, in its previous um four years in office. Uh, but we're drawing near to the end of the program, and I'd like to give each of you uh, one minute in order to predict pot uh, potentially or uh, provide some additional details. Up to you. Professor Berman, we'll start with you. 
Oh, I am not going to predict. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting the real results uh, soon. And even though, as I said before, the count is going to take some time. I think what we've seen, though, is a degree of um, partisan politicization of degree of support for Israel, uh, Israeli support has the support for Israel has moved more to the Republican side than on the Democratic side, which is increasingly dependent on its 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 progressive progressive wing. Um, but I don't think this is only a um, U.S. phenomenon. I believe if one tracked um, the spread of support for Israel in Europe as well, you'd see it moving away from the left wing parties. Ambassador Elon. Well, I would hope uh, certainly for uh, American. Uh, America's internal peace and uh, world stability that we will have a decisive um, result because uh, the third option whereby we will not know who is the president until maybe the end of the year and uh, we know already that both parties have uh, recruited a host of uh, lawyers to appeal to uh, take it to um, uh, recounts and other kind of things from uh, the you know, the the court's orders, and that would not be good for the world. So I hope there will be a decisive result that everybody will know, both in America and in the world, who is the next occupant of the White House. Yes. Irrespective, if you failed to vote uh, until now, uh, it's important. Uh, make your voice heard. Uh, every vote counts. Uh, I'd like to immediately thank Professor Russell Berman and Ambassador Dania Yalon for all of your insights. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next edition, uh, from here in Jerusalem, wishing you a good evening and shalom. Shalom, I'm Danny Ayalon, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, former deputy foreign minister and member of Knesset. Today, I'm very privileged to be hosting TV7's Middle East Review and also being a panelist of the various shows of TV7, which I find the most uh, enlightening, most educating. If you really want to understand the world, the global scene, as well as the regional scene of the Middle East, it is worthwhile to watch TV7.